Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to your Dog's Friend webinar series. Today's webinar is about at-home scent games. And the speaker, I am happy to say, is J.C. Kelly. He is probably our area's leading expert on nose work, and he's an old friend of your dog's friend. Um, let me tell you something about him. JC is the owner of Canine Co-Pilots in Northern Virginia. He has over 20 years of experience training dogs. He was a military working dog handler in the United States Air Force, a contract dog handler for numerous federal agencies, and now works primarily with companion dogs. When I say working with military dogs, I mean finding explosives, teaching dogs how to do that. In 2010, JC became the first certified canine nose work instructor in the Mid-Atlantic region, and he had classes in both Maryland and Virginia. He has instructed at canine nose work camps, is a certifying official for NACSW official trials, as well as a judge for these trials. Um, I do want to tell you all, though, that what we will be talking about is not competitive nose work. Uh, we're talking about scent games that you can play at home. So if your question is about competition, probably hold it. OK, we will be stopping for questions periodically. Uh, put your questions in chat. JC will pick them up and answer as many as he can. I also want to mention that these webinars and our other free programs are pretty much dependent on donations. So if you are so inclined, you could go to our homepage and there is a donations icon in the upper right corner. Otherwise, I will also put a link um, in chat, but probably most people will come in late and won't see it. Okay, um, I already got a message. Could you please write his name down? Oh, okay, it'll be in the presentation. All right, so let me, let's go back to, to my bio. One, I hate hearing about myself and writing the bio. I did that 12 years ago, and I don't think I've ever changed it. Um, just because I know the, the world that I came from and the world that I'm in, I just want everybody to know right off the bat, I don't use choke chain. I stopped doing that a long time ago. Everything about my training is relationship built, uh, relationship based and the betterment of the dog's experience and the dog's whole life is my priority. We don't correct things. We don't do any of that, uh, any of the stuff that it, that I used to do, we used to do in the military. So um, generally before uh, before anybody invites me into their dog training house, that's their first question is, when's the last time you used a choke chain? And it was probably 1997. Um, so with that, with that out there, I'm going to dive into, directly into what we're doing today. Um, as Deborah said, I... I, there is a competition component to it. This isn't the place where I want competition questions and, and everything. This whole program is something that, uh, that I started at your dog's friend uh, 12 years ago. And it was for reactive dogs. It was for environmentally sensitive dogs. It was for dogs that, that needed some environmental enrichment. And why, why was it nose work? One, this was an obvious transition. I right? go, from being a detector dog handler to teaching detection in the companion world. 
but it, I really quickly figured out that it was completely different. Um, so when I started at your dog's friend, I had 16 students, two classes in probably the worst time slot, 7.30 on a Sunday morning. And I was out of there by 11 on that Sunday, uh, Sunday early afternoon. We had 16 people who came every single week for two solid years. And of those 16, at least half of them had reactive dogs. There was at least one dog in there that our class was the last stop. She had tried reactivity, she had the reactive classes. She had tried all this other stuff. And then she started doing those work. And, and the dog really blossomed and the reactivity started to go away. The, the, the environmental sensitivity started to, to diminish. And disclaimer, not a cure for any of that stuff, but it really did help. And that's when I started to, to really look at and, and pay attention to what this is really doing. Because before that, it was simple, find it, good boy. And we moved on. I never really put a whole lot of thought into why it works, what this was doing for the dog. So as we progress through 10, 12 years later, bam, pandemic hits. Um, now you're all stuck at home with your dog. How do you do nose work? without a training center, without an instructor, without, uh, without guidance. Well, turns out it's not that hard of a thing to do. And that's some of the things that we're going to talk about is if you don't have access to a trainer or if your dog is too stressed to get to a training facility, you know, how can you do this at home and help your dog? So here's Canine Co-Pilots uh, established 13 years ago here in the DC metro area. We do have trainers. Um, that have worked all around the D.C. metro area, Maryland, Virginia. Um, not really in D.C. There's not a whole lot of space in D.C. for us, but uh, I do travel across the country to do workshops uh, periodically. But once or twice a month, I'm, I'm out of the area doing these workshops for, uh, for nose work enthusiasts all over the country. So let's get right into it. Why do dogs sniff everything? Um, if you've ever walked a dog, which I think almost all of you probably have, um, you understand that the dog has this, this uncontrollable need to sniff everything. You're three steps off the front lawn and they're sniffing and sniffing and sniffing the entire walk. It gets pretty frustrating for some of us, I think. But if they understand why they sniff, maybe it won't be as frustrating. Maybe we can allow them to, uh, to do their thing. Um, one thing. They sniff things to embarrass us. I don't know, the head in the crotch. That's a classic move that uh, uh, dogs will do. I'm not entirely sure why. I, I assume that it's probably hormonal. It's something they're just trying to sniff to see what uh, what mood we're in. Um, they sniff each other in the crotch area. This is definitely a hormonal base. They're, they're trying to figure out if that dog, the other dog is angry, upset, um, is it time for breeding? You know, they, they get a lot of information from that move right there. And again, it's kind of embarrassing to some of us, but uh, if they don't do it, the dogs don't know who they're dealing with. This is, this is the equivalent to me walking up to somebody and telling them who I am and introducing myself to them, showing them my ID, doing something to let them know that I'm here. This is my name. And I mean you no harm. They'll sniff your shoes. Uh, if you walk in from a, uh, a day out, they go and run and sniff your shoes first. And why do they do that? Because they can tell the entire history of the day. You can, they can tell the entire history of that pair of shoes when they go sniff it. And they want to find out who you've been cheating with. Boundaries. They set boundaries by peeing on things. Any kind of vertical surface, uh, the fire hydrant, because some dogs don't like to fight stereotypes. Um, they do it to trees. There are very good ways to set a boundary. And if that dog right there says, Oop, this belongs to Fido, I probably should either pee on it and claim it as my own, or I should leave because Fido is not very pleasant. And they sniff any kind of new object. You know, once a year, people bring Christmas trees into the house. And this dog is probably experiencing the Christmas tree for at a minimum the first time in 11 months, possibly the first time in their life. So they want to investigate it to see if it's edible, to see if it's going to eat them, to see if they need to roll in it or run from it. They, they sniff everything because that's 
That's how they get all of their sensory input from the world around them. You know, it's their view of the world. We look out the window and we see the trees and everything, but they smell all of that stuff. The dog's noses work in a directional manner. They pull odor from the right and they can tell if the bunny is on the right. They'll pull it from the left and they can tell that it's over there. They can tell distance. Um, I used to explain how dogs' noses work as is it's how we see the world, but that's way oversimplified. It's how we see the world. It's how we hear the world. It's how how we we actually smell the world. That's that is their whole view of the world is that nose. So how does the dog's nose work? Well, it's a very simple device, but that is probably the most impressively designed smelling device there is. Um, they have big holes in the front of their nose to pull odor in and those little flares on the side to kick odor out. And that's specifically so they don't disrupt the odor flow of those molecules that's moving towards them. So they pull it in, they kick it out to the side, and they can continue to build up um, odor molecules in their, uh, in their nasal passageway to process through the uh, scent receptors. So in and out. It's very simple. And it's very effective. There's just a cross cut of the anatomy of their nose. You'll see another picture in a couple of slides um, that will demonstrate a, a, another thing. But you have the, the hard palate and the nasal cavity, all of these ascent receptors all through here. Their, in, their entire front part of their head is filled with these, these scent receptors and all of this other good stuff that is used to process the, the olfactory system. And they can also smell by pulling air in through their mouth. If you, they follow this path across the top of their tongue, get through here, this is called the Jacobson organ. And this is where they take in all that hormonal information. Uh, if you're walking your dog and they're licking, they're licking a bush, and you're pretty sure that your dog is now licking dog pee, it's actually them taking in the hormones from the pee. If they're licking that spot on the ground, they're taking in hormones just to see what's going on with the other dog that left that, left that little prize there for them. So olfaction is the sense of smell. That's, that's simple. Um, there, there's a more complicated scientific based uh, um, explanation to it, but it's the sense of smell. Uh, they, they process the information through their olfactory system. And truth be told, most of the dog's brain is dedicated to the olfactory system. Um, there are two, the main olfactory system and the accessory olfactory system. The main is their, their main nasal passageway that the odor molecules roll in through. The accessory is the one that comes through the Jacobson organ to, to detect the pheromones. Um, <clears throat> And I've already gone through most of this. So it comes in, it's the scent, the, uh, scent receptors, and then it processes into their brain. One third of the dog's brain is dedicated to processing those odor molecules and the information that's coming in through those scent receptors. The other two thirds is processing what to do with it. Um, they, they attach each odor to something, to some kind of stimulus in the environment. So they take in... Um, in our case, they take in the smell of hot dog. It equals, whoo cool, hot dog. I get to go hunt for boxes. And it produces a positive emotional response and a positive reaction to that response. Um, other things can be bad. Oh, that smells like a cat, and I don't like cats. So it, it's all getting stored in the other two-thirds of that brain. It processes whether to eat it, roll in it, run from it pee on it or hump it. Those are the five real big things that your dog is concerned with, with every sniff that you take in, process, and file away in their file cabinet. And there it is again. The scent receptors are right there. And here's your Jacobson organ. This, this spot right in here. The odor comes in, drifts up through there, and it all gets processed, uh, processed and then filed away. So every experience that your dog has is processed and filed into good, bad, or indifferent uh, files. And these create emotional triggers for the lifetime of the dog. Um, good 
good odors and good connections sometimes will take a little bit longer than bad ones. And that's really, I believe, because the need to survive is a pretty strong one in, in all living creatures, and dogs are no different. Um, if they avoid bad triggers, that means it increases the likelihood of not getting eaten by a cat or uh, run over by a car or whatever the the stimulus is. It's formed pretty quickly. Um, I had a dog that uh, he, he was not a Labrador retriever, and he burned his nose on the oven. And you know what he never did again? He never sniffed an open oven door. I know lab owners out there are saying, yes, my dog would probably do it three or four times before they started to get the picture. But um, that sniffing, I'm pretty sure whatever was in the oven became the emotional trigger to keep the dog away from that, that herdy. Um, another dog that every time I would make bacon, I'd set the smoke alarm off. As soon as I would start to fry bacon after a couple of times, she would get all panicky and weird because she knew I was about to set that smoke, det- the smoke detector off. And so I somehow very quickly made a negative association with the smell of bacon. So dogs form these bonds with these odors and, and access them constantly to survive, to eat, to get pleasure, to get, uh, to get away from bad things. Um, and that is one of the things that we do tap into in our nose work world we use those bonds and emotions, emotional responses to help them overcome some of those problems. Um, bad behaviors can come from it too. If you have a dog that was abused, say a Christmas puppy, and the Christmas puppy is a crazy puppy because all puppies are, and Christmas puppies are bad because of that, um, they knock the Christmas tree down. Dad goes nuts and yells at the dog, tosses it into a crate, and ends up dropping it off at an animal shelter. This is a horrible situation. The one smell that is going to be consistent from that situation to the situation uh, uh, that might come up eight, nine months after you adopt a dog is the Christmas tree smell. That Christmas tree smell is attached to the trauma of what had happened. And again, not, not scientifically based. It just makes sense to me that if the puppy gets hurt or abused or scared while they're in the, the presence of this big, strong odor, and because it's not an everyday odor for them to help get over, as soon as that Christmas tree comes into the new house, it triggers some kind of an emotional response, which may actually drive them to tearing up the Christmas tree or using the bathroom in the house or other behavioral problems because that odor is so strong to them. All right, before we move into the next segment, I want to answer a few of the questions that have come in. Casey, we don't have any real questions yet. Okay. Not about what you're discussing. Let me close that back down then, and we'll just move on. Maybe. Actually, one question just did come in. Okay. Is it easy to it change in? a bad scent memory to a good one? Ah, good question. Is it easy to change a bad scent memory to a good one? No. Um, it's, it's, and something, I think in dog training terms of counter conditioning, a behavior that is, that is hardwired into them now, something that, something bad to have, you know, reactivity. We can, we can, Why does a dog react? Because they have uh, uh, no trust in an environment, no trust in a handler. They don't know the other dog. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why a dog will react outwardly. Um, It's it's not as simple as just showing the dog that, hey, that dog is cool. It it takes a long time to counter condition the experiences that that dog is reacting, that's causing that dog to react. So, it's the same with odor, and I think it probably takes an even longer time. If it can actually be done where you override a previous input and uh, make it positive. Uh, you can go the opposite direction pretty quickly, go from a positive to a negative pretty quickly. But remember, the, the reaction to the stimulus that is negative is usually based on the dog's perception of the environment and what they need to do to survive. And survival is going to trump just about anything else that you do. 
same reason why a active dog that's truly over threshold and reacting won't take food is because food is not important as the escape or the driving off the potential enemy. So you see the other question. Okay. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with dogs' reactivity to some, but not all other dogs. Um, possibly. Uh, again, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a reactive dog expert, nor do I have science on it. But um, I, I do believe that uh, maybe it's not even the dogs. Maybe it's the people. Maybe it's something else. Uh, something else that the dogs bringing to the environment. I think from from dog to dog reactivity. My personal opinion is it it's more bad experiences. Number one. And number two, it goes to floppy versus prick-eared dogs, flat-faced dogs versus uh, long-nosed dogs. I think all of the things that uh, um, that inhibit body language recognition from one dog to the next. I think that's probably more prominent than the sense of smell, unless that other dog is coming in over a aroused or uh, your dog can smell the hormones and the, the odor that your other that the other dog is putting off. There, it can be it can be a trigger. Types of working dogs that that you've seen out about you know for centuries we've been using the dogs to hunt, to find people, to find things, to uh, to guard our campments, our encampments, uh, and to find stuff that they were trained to to, to find. Um, in Vietnam, we didn't have detector dogs. However, there were dogs that were being used to find landmines and booby traps because the handlers that were getting these dogs airdrop to them knew how to teach them to find raccoons or rabbits or deer or, or pheasants. And they just applied what they did on the farm or what they did out in the woods uh, with their fathers and their grandfathers um, to what they were doing here. So even in a more rudimentary sense, as far back as Vietnam, we were using dogs to find booby traps we were, and, and other things to keep people safe. Um, first thing, detector dogs. This is my area of expertise. Uh, the dog, the Dalmatian top left is an actual, or he was, an actual certified explosive detector dog. Really good dog. Hated people. Really good dog. And uh picture to the bottom right is me doing a search uh, with my old dog Bones, who was still around when we first started doing classes. I was still doing that job when I first started at Your Dogs, and, and we're, we're searching for explosives around one of our uh, government contracts. Um, other things that these dogs have been trained to find, and, and by no means are we limited to what you see here, but you know, drugs, narcotics, bombs, uh, truffles, there's a um, dogs that are trained to find these little mushrooms that get you about 1500 bucks a pound or an ounce or something is a ridiculous amount of money to, to be made if your dog can find truffles. Um, bed bugs, other types of insects, termites, um, um, invasive species. I, I know somebody who's working on, um, working with, um, uh, finding sick bee populations to help, uh, call them. So they don't infect the rest of the bee population in certain areas. Uh, frogs, plants, all kinds of different things. If it has a smell, you can teach a dog to find it. Um, the next thing is air sensing, search and rescue. Uh, think in terms of hide and seek. Uh, if, you, if you or or somebody else wanders off into the woods, chances are they're going to call a search and rescue team out there so they can cover 800 acres in far less time that it would take a group of people to go out and systematically search that area. Dogs are really good at at finding people lost in the woods. Um, next is um, cadaver dogs. Uh, this is the post search and rescue. Uh, they're they're looking in rubble piles. They're looking in, in you see one one down here searching the water. Uh, one about to start doing a track and this, he also is probably starting to do a track or when it becomes not search and rescue, and it turns into a recovery situation. Um, gas and water leaks under the ground. They can smell gas coming up and tell you roughly where that water leak or that gas line is leaking. They can smell what the water is doing and the difference from the normal soil to where that water is coming up and altering the soil smell. They can find water leaks 
pretty easily by just working along that water pump, water line or gas line that happens to be buried five, six feet underground. And as far as cadaver goes, they can find, I, I, I've heard of um, cadaver dogs finding Civil War era um, unmarked graves. So they can find pieces of us from two, three hundred years ago and beyond. Um, ground scenting, there's your tracking. They do urban and woodland tracking. And yes, all of these can be tied into you doing something in your house, on your property, in your backyard, or in a park next to you. That's why I'm talking about all of them, because this is all stuff that you can do um, all by yourself or with the help of, of a trainer or just a friend who wants to go get lost. Um, tracking, there's a couple of different types, woodland and urban. So we've talked about the woodland where people get lost in the woods. It happens all the time. This is what they do. They bring out the bring out a dog and they will go hunt until they find you. Um, urban, they will do if they're, you're lost or, or something in the city. The dogs can still hunt and, and do this tracking across sidewalks and across blacktop and through the variable surfaces. All of this can be done as a fun, fun exercise. I watched, uh, I think it's probably on Animal Planet. It was a video of a tracking dog that had to do an urban certification test in San Diego. And the job was start at the uh, start and work around the outside of uh, San Diego's baseball stadium and track the guy, the trainer who was at the baseball game the day before all the way to the seat that he was sitting in. It took him a little while, but he did it. And that dog found the seat that the trainer was sitting in the day before. Any questions up to this point? Any more? No questions. All right. So now we're going to get into the, the, the stuff that you're here for, um, the nose games. I started doing these nose games at nose work classes, um, and now like I said in the beginning, I saw the change that was occurring with the reactive dogs and with some of the more um, environmentally sensitive dogs. There's a dog that I worked with at your dog's friend before I actually left, uh, that was a hoarding rescue, and the dog actually could only tolerate the human that rescued her. And she came in with another dog from the household for at least six weeks, if not a little bit longer. For the first six weeks, hung out in the crate. For the next six weeks, hung out outside the crate, and the handler was doing stuff with her back there just to build some comfort. And then when she got into the ring with us, and she started moving. I actually left the ring. I'd sit down and I minimized the amount of uh, running of my mouth. I did just let the dog go um, and and really start to trust the environment and, and get comfortable in her own skin. And through these classes, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a six, eight, 12 week turnaround. It was probably at least a year that we were working with this dog. We could get her out into parks and, and work her in parks and, the, just the, the amount of, of joy that, that you could see in this dog's existence from that year's worth of work was, that was why I was doing those work. And then let's fast forward to a point where the hand handed me the leash at one point and walked across the road. I stopped and a van drove between the two of us and the dog, this hoarding rescue dog that was terrified of anything bipedal yipped a little bit, spun, looked up, saw it was me, and she just sat next to me. She's like, okay, you're, you're cool. I'm like, boom, I'm so old. You know, if I never teach a dog to find something that's going to blow up or kill somebody again, this is perfect. This is a great way to end my career. I took a dog that I think in, in a lot of cases probably would not have been kept around for as long as, uh, as we worked with her, and I'm pretty sure grew to have a really nice life. Actually, Debbie might be on this uh, on this uh, presentation or walk uh, at some point in time later. But that dog right there really changed my opinion of what nose work and scent games is is really supposed to be. Um, don't tell anybody, but teaching a dog to find a target odor is probably the easiest thing you'll do in dog training. Um, teaching them the tools and getting them to overcome those fears. That's where, that's where the money's made. That's, uh, that's the hard part. That's why I'm, I'm here with you guys today. So 
what do nose games do for these dogs? They allow them to hunt. They allow them to find things. They allow them to eat. They allow them to do pretty much whatever it is that they want to do. And you know why dogs like the classes? Because I don't let the handlers do anything. Hardest part for a handler and a trainer is to do nothing at all. Just let the dog go. Um, a good intro to nose work class should bore the handler. You should walk out of there going, wow, I did absolutely nothing. It's about letting the dog go and, and show you what they're capable of. I'm going to minimize, stop sharing, and show you a couple of videos from past classes. All right, so we're going to start with an intro, definitely sensitive, but, um, you know, not too bad. She didn't like hula hoop. She didn't like stuff and uh, just weird stuff. I don't think she was okay with the boxes either. Um, and this is it. This is what an intro to nose work class looks like. Um, boxes spread all over the place. Um, play again and pause and, and show you where the hides are. So hide number one is here. Now, you see the joy and unbridled enthusiasm with that dog. She's like, I am free. This is great. She's running around. That little head bob there, there's some food in that box, and I'm pretty sure back in that box there. Um, this is just her getting her footing under her and figuring out that life is pretty cool. And see what the handler's doing? Absolutely nothing. And that dog has actually actually is a competition dog, and she I believe is at the elite level now. So pretty accomplished dog, and that handler is a, a pretty accomplished handler. They did start with us at your dog's friend a long time ago as well. Um, so let me get to the next page or the next video. Here is her second dog. Um, as soon as I get it shared. This dog is named Scoop. Um, same search area. He's got more experience under his belt as he's, uh, I think, about a year, year and a half more, if not more, more experience than Etta did. But he's doing the same run that the beginner dog did. The, the, he doesn't care what's going on. He's just getting a chance to go out there and hunt and play and find stuff and have a good time. Neither one of them were all that environmentally sensitive. Neither one of them had uh, had any uh, any kind of deep deep dark secrets that they were scared of. But they both they both had to overcome some things and really enjoyed doing those. And the last one is Izzy. This is a dog who, as you watch her move around the room. You can see Izzy had some neck and back issues. Uh, the other cool part about it is agility is high impact. Fly ball, high impact. Herding can be high impact. And those are to be tailored to the dog who has physical issues, who has um, some pain that they're dealing with also. So it's not just about the environmental sensitivities. It's, it's something that you can build for a dog who can't lift her head up. And this is, I believe, an odor class. So she's not even hunting for hot dogs. Here she's looking for a target odor. Right in there. So the only thing the handler does is comes in and gives her a paycheck. Um, we, we are going to talk about what that paycheck is in a, a, another slide or two. Um, do you want to answer so, a very few questions? Um, one was, can dogs track through water? Ah. Uh, water dogs can and again i'm not a tracker nor am i a water uh a water dog person um how do you even know what the proper terminology for that would be but um dogs can track the air molecules if and this is how the um cadaver dogs and the search dogs that find um things underwater or mine dogs they they've used uh they can use dogs to find mines and stuff in water and it's the odor molecules that come up hit the surface and pop the dogs can detect that and get you moving in the direction of where that item is we have done we have done uh, some training in the rain because you know detector dogs detect in the rain in the heat in the wind it doesn't matter you got to be able to work them in all environments 
So if it's a little bit of water, not a rushing stream or a river, uh, they can track through the little bits of water. Uh, there's still odor molecules present on the surface. I think we use Q-tips with um, uh, odor residue from, from our essential oils. If you submerge a tin of those, about eight or ten of these half Q-tips, into a bowl of water, you can see the oils mixing on the top, and that's what the dogs will find. And generally, I think if you're going across a big body of water, it's not so much tracking through the water, it's the handler getting the dog to the other side just to pick up where that uh, where that scent, uh, where that track is on the other side. Because if you go in, you eventually have to come back out. There's also more whether you let the dog get the treat in the boxes or just reward the dog after they find the right box. Hi. I'm going to cover that in a minute, but yeah, you let the dog, okay. this is a self-rewarding behavior. Um, you let the dog go in there and, and self-reward. I think that's uh, the one thing we'll do that for is just to build the dog's independence. Cause you, if you're trying to find something that you don't know what's at, the dog has to be independent enough to get you to where that object is at. You don't want them constantly looking back to you for validation that they're right. We want the odor to be the thing that teaches the dog that they are right, that shows the dog that they are correct. So all of the reward, the joy, and the happiness comes from the source. Anything that the handler does after that becomes secondary. All right. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's one. If the dog gets lost, can it follow its own scent back? Um, I would imagine it could. You know, its own scent should be should be familiar to it. And if he's, if the dog's lost and doesn't come back because they don't follow their own scent, that probably means the dog didn't want to come back right away. Um, but, yeah, the, it, the, I'm fairly certain the dog can find its own scent and use it to track back to wherever it came from. All right. If there's no more uh, no more questions, we'll move into the how. Um, coolest part about nose work at home, uh, nose work even in the training center is if you've been in a training center that has agility equipment, that stuff's heavy, that stuff's expensive, that stuff takes up a lot of space. Um, in your dog's friend, I don't know if it's still the same way, but we have a shelf and I think two or three levels of that shelf had some cardboard boxes and plastic things stuffed on it and that is our equipment that's all we need you know you can get all the equipment you need um, from Amazon all you have to do order some boxes and those boxes come with stuff in it um, save cardboard boxes everyone that comes in and that's what you use um, if you have 12 boxes use three for your food for your target um, you don't want to use all of the boxes, get food all in them, and then store them back in your garage or in your closet because other creatures like to do nose work too, like ants and rats and mice. Uh, you don't want these boxes full of food crumbs just laying around. The same thing, if you're planning on doing this work in a training center, use dedicated boxes and recycle them, throw them away, get rid of them, or else your training center is going to end up with mice. It's going to end up with with other uh, other types of not so pleasant uh, nose working creatures. Um, I've started to use some plastic containers, and the containers that I look for are plastic, and the ones that are more flexible, um, butter dishes, um, some of the, the the Chinese food uh, delivery things. Um, any kind of flexible plastic, if it's brittle, like most of the plastic you can get from a dollar store, as soon as a dog puts a paw on it, it shatters and you have plastic shards all over the place. You want something that's going to be flexible, and pliable for the safety of the dog, and you don't really want plastic all over your house. Um, other you know, other storage containers, a game that I like to play uh, with the muffin pans and cupcake pans is I'll take that and that you see there, and I'll put six tennis balls in it, and underneath one of the tennis balls, I will put their their food, whatever their target is, their, their motivator is. I'll put it underneath one tennis ball, and then let the dogs come out and play uh, play the guessing game. Find the find the ball that is hiding the, the hot dogs, and even though all six of those balls are really close, those dogs can't identify the one hot spot in that tiny little pan. 
um, motivator. Let's find something your dog really, really wants. And the more stressed and anxious your dog is, the more awesome that motivator needs to be. Now, if you don't have a stressed and anxious dog, that doesn't give you permission to use Charlie Bears or some kind of boring, bland training treat that you always use for sit or down or recalls or whatever, um, whatever other training you're doing. Um, anybody who says my dog just loves Charlie Bears, that's, that's just a lie to, to tell ourselves, to convince ourselves that it's okay to use something that's clean and easy. Um, the reason a lot of working dog handlers, myself was included in this, used a Kong is because the smell of hot dog and special cuts and all of these other meaty good uh, good foods, yeah, they're gross. If you're working in a hot climate and you have a bag full of hot dogs on your hip, no, that's, that's, that's a bad, bad smelling human being at the end of the day. Nobody wants to hang out with you after that. So our dogs would work for Kongs. They would work for tennis balls because that's the type of dog that they were. They were bred for and selected for that type of thing. But when you're dealing with a reactive dog, or a stressed dog, one that needs a little bit of motivation to move forward and step backward, that motivation has got to be more valuable to them than what they think might happen to them if they take that step into that box. So hot dogs, you don't have to give them a whole hot dog. Just dice them up into tiny little pieces and give them eight or 10 of them in this box and just let them have let them go. Um, uh, roast chicken. You know, dogs do have do have um, dietary issues. Some dogs like to get fat. Uh, um, disclaimer: lab owner, so that's why I pick on them. Um, a lab will eat until it's the size of a small Volkswagen. You you want to minimize the amount of bad stuff you're putting in the boiled chicken, roast chicken, something like that is is good for them. You have to find what your dog likes. Um, pizza crumbs. I don't care. Um, it's not about what I want or what you want. It's what they want. So when you find that motivator, you put it in the box, and this is where it gets complicated. Set the box down and just walk away from it. Dog's going to look at you like you're crazy. The dog's going to look at you like it's a trap. Um, are you, what, kind of, what kind of witchcraft are you trying to pull here? They don't necessarily intuitively want to jump into this strange box that's now full of food that they've never gotten. Just step back and let them investigate it and let them figure this out on their own. And then when they find it, repeat the process. Put more food in the box and just put it in a different place. Maybe add a couple of other boxes. Maybe spread the boxes out a little bit. Maybe set a second odor box down so they hit one, finish, and they get up and they move and they continue to search and they continue to hunt. And they find that other box. Add three more. Um, start tucking it into corners and around behind the furniture in the in the house. Um, just as long as the dogs have access to it, there's no way to go wrong because they're hunting for food. Um, if you feel like you're going to break your dog or cause a dog that doesn't want to go hunt for food, think about how many times they've chased squirrels and actually have been successful. Um, the, none of my dogs have ever caught a squirrel. Doesn't mean they haven't tried. And it doesn't mean that they've ever given up on potentially getting that squirrel. They're going to continue to do it, even if they have troubles with that box. So why does this work? Why am I, why am I droning on and on and on about doing nose work and letting the dog search? It's because this exercises their mind. Uh, a Sudoku puzzle. We do Sudoku puzzles. This is their Sudoku puzzle. This is their crossword puzzle. This is... This is them using their brain for what it was designed for. Um, other games to play, three-card Monty. You know, I'll take the, take the three cups, and I'm sure if you go on to um, TikTok or YouTube and, and just watch dog videos, you'll see, or just type in dog videos, you'll see somebody who has two cups, and they, they have a piece of food underneath one, and they just swirl it around and let the dog investigate the two cups. And pick which one that they want to, uh, they, they want you to open up and they find the food that way. It's simple. It's done right in front of you and it apparently makes great, uh, a great TikTok video. Um, hide and seek. Um, if you have kids, I like to do stuff that helps 
build relationships between the kids and the dogs too. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of uh, uh, behavioral issues that are directed towards humans, they either start with uh, an overbearing man or kids that just don't understand the craziness is driving the dog nuts too. So help build a relationship with the kid. Um, hold the dog in one room, have, have the kid run to another room and then hide and, and release the dog. The dog is going to sniff and find. And when the dog finds that kid or finds that other, it doesn't have to be a kid, finds that other human and you play tug with them, you give them food, you play with them, you party with them. This is going to become a game that you can move to the outside. Uh, you can move to a park. You can move anywhere. You can play this game with this other person uh, pretty uh, pretty much anywhere. And it is, gives the dog a chance to sniff, find a human that they actually care about and trust and love, and get a reinforcement. So it's, it's something that uh, is relationship building, and it stimulates their brain. And it does give them some physical exercise, too. Um, if you uh, want to get real ambitious and you live in a house of multiple levels, stand outside. Have your have the other person run into the house and hide anywhere in the house. Just let the dog go. The dog will hunt until they find that target, which is the other human. And this is probably the simplest of all those games. When you take a dog, take a walk. Let your dog sniff. I think that dogs. When they come into our lives, we have to have jobs to support our dog habit. Um, we've got to get kids to school. We've, we've got schedules. We've got things to do. And, and none of that revolves around giving the dog 45 minutes on a walk to sniff every blade of grass, to return every female that they've read all the way through. We don't have that kind of time. You get 10 minutes, you go out, you get 10 minutes on the way back. you got to do your business in those 20 minutes. And then they go back in the house. I think a significant part of the dog's existence in their brain begins to atrophy because they're not allowed to use it. They're not allowed to exercise it. They're not allowed to process it. So it builds on some of the uh, anxieties they have when we leave. It builds on some of the reactivities because the walks aren't fun anymore. So let them sniff. Your walk might be 15 feet, but if they've done all their business and they've spent 20 minutes checking all of those emails and responding and, and figuring out what's going on, all catching up on all the gossip in the neighborhood, it's going to go a long way to help them relax and calm down. And you just might put them in there and they would lay down and go to sleep because they've exercised that brain. So nose work works because we give a, give the dogs a chance to do what they were created to do, whether you're spiritual, whether you're genetics, whether it's science, whether I don't know, selective breeding, wherever you're, you, you believe dogs came from, this is the one thing that they were, that we can all agree on, is they were created to use their nose to move through life. Um, it gives them something to do when they get stressed. The, the dog turns and starts sniffing away um, from the thing that stresses them. It puts them in a position with their head down so the other dog doesn't react. It gives them an opportunity to move away. It gives you an opportunity to find them, and it helps build comfort. And it's just fun. Um, we do agility because it's fun for us. We do um, fly ball because because it's fun for us and it's, it's fun for the dogs too. But I know the humans who are doing it have to want to do it. Um, I went to canine school 23 years ago, so I never had to run again. Um, now I've met thousands of agility people who go out and run with the dog on a pretty regular basis because they want to do it. That's why we do it. But they do this stuff because it is fun for them. All right, any questions? Yeah, they're actually um, a fair number. Um, again, this may be something you're going to cover. Do you start with a treat in the boxes or a scent item followed by a treat? All right, we start right with the controversial question. Some people start with the target odor. This group, the people I'm talking to today, start with food. You put food in a box and that's it. Don't over overthink it. Don't, um, don't think in terms of I want to train a detector dog because disclaimer number whatever I'm on. 
I'm not teaching detector dogs. I'm teaching companion animals how to do nose work and, and scent work. So start with a cardboard box with a small pile of food inside that box and just let them go. Um, there are other classes and workshops where we add the target odor. Um, that target odor is is really unnecessary for as, as far as the dogs go. They don't care about the target odor. What they care about is the food that's in the box. So if you're truly working to help desensitize or to build comfort, just go with the food. Um, reach out if you, if you want to reach out to a certified trainer or a, or another trainer if um, you want to um, you want to get into the target odor. The only reason the target odor is there is because of the competition aspect of it. Do you need to use the same motivator every time, or can you switch between hot dogs, cheese, etc.? You can switch. You, you can switch, uh, and I actually recommend it. Um, and just like us, I think dogs do get bored with the same thing over and over again. Now, it might take them longer to get bored with prime rib than it would, say, Cheerios or Charlie Bears. But you know, keep it uh, keep it fresh. Keep it um, different for your dog. They are going to tell you if there's something there that they really, really like, but they're going to tell you that there's something that they don't like. I've, I've used, I've done classes where I've taken in six different bait pouches and I will use a little bit from each bait pouch in each hide. It's a tiny little bit. And there are dogs that'll come in and they'll eat all the cheese and they'll leave the, any kind of bread product. There are dogs that'll come in and they will destroy the bread product and maybe leave the cheese behind. Um, Another trainer I know did a class where she had them bring in three different bags of, of rewards. And in their day pouch, they put the Charlie Bears and the Kibble, and they did a run. And then in the second run, they put in cheese and you know, something else, a slightly higher level motivator. And in the third run, this is where she had um, some steak and bacon and some really good cheeses. And the the, the level of interaction with the actual search itself increased from run to run based on what that handler brought into the training area with them. Um, so uh, short story, long, vary it up. Um, when you find something your dog doesn't want, don't use it again. We don't want to try to force them to like a Charlie Bear. We don't want to force them to, to like something else. We want them to enjoy what's, what's out there. And you can tell if they run to it, trot to it, or go to that box and just covet and hold on to that box so it doesn't get away. You'll be able to tell what they like. Do you mark when they find the food? Um, again, at this point, no need. It's a self-reward. The reward is delivered in the place where it needs to be. I mean, at, at that point, what are you marking anyway? Yes, you want them to find the, the box and if you move on to a trial you want them to you want the dog to tell you where the hide is at but in this case we're just letting the dog search it doesn't matter where it's at to us it's just letting them go because you know the hide's at you need them to go find it is this an inside or outside game um either both um you can do it inside i prefer to start it inside for, for a reactive dog, a stress dog, so one, a dog with special needs, I'd prefer to start it in the most comfortable area for that dog. So if and we have had dogs come into classes that are stressed in the, in the search area, you, you bring them in. And I think in our first classes, we had eight, eight teams. So if you bring a dog in that can't operate with those eight teams, I would tell that person to go home do this at home and build the concept at home and then bring the dog out and we'll get them comfortable here. And, and for a couple of classes, we didn't, uh, we've had some, some dogs that didn't even come out of their pods because they weren't comfortable yet. But by the end of the class, by the end of a couple of sessions, the dogs were okay and they could come out because we allowed them to uh, build, build trust in the environment and in the handler. Do you let the dog watch you hide the treats so the dog knows they're there and then 
put the boxes around? Um, again, and there's, there's two answers to that. Some, some people believe in blindfolding the dogs and putting them in another room. Um, I think that helps build the suspense, and I think it might actually um, entice the dog to go faster. But I've also done I've done work with dogs where I've taken three boxes, one of them hot, the other one not, and I just start tossing boxes around and slide them across the floor and, and sneak the uh, the food out into the environment with them sitting right there looking at me. Um, either way, uh, you, you just you just want to be able to initiate have the dog initiate the search on their own. So putting them away, as long as they understand what's going on, that's the way I would prefer to do it. But again, I don't actually believe the dogs are cheating when they're watching because I've had dogs make direct eye contact with me when I put a hide out and they get released to go do the search and then they just go and search. It's not necessarily about the finding. Some dogs are clever enough to know that if there's three hides out there and they find all three, then the game ends. So they will find two out of three and then play dumb and not find that third one until they have searched the rest of the room. Are there certain breeds that are better at nose work? Um, There are certain breeds that are more, I think, more built for it. Um, Some dogs, your brave feel sound like your short, stubby nose dogs. Um, They're really good at it. You just have to monitor their activity level and all of the temperatures in the room. You don't want them to overheat because I've also found that the average Boston barrier doesn't realize it will die if it works at 110 miles an hour in 80 degree weather. So outside of the physical makeup, no, I, one dog will search just as well as the next. You just have to find the motivator and build skills and, and the independence in them. Um, one of my favorite dogs that I that I've watched since I started doing this was a little Boston Terrier. Uh, we just lost her two weeks ago, I think. Uh, a Boston Terrier named Bo. Um, when I met that handler, she's a German lady who I know has Malinois. In that first class, she brought a Malinois in, and she asked me if she could bring Bo. So I think to myself, I said, "Self, bring it." Um, and I told her, yeah, bring Bo. I didn't bother to ask what Bo was. And she showed up with this Boston Terrier. And I was like, I didn't know what to do with this thing. That dog was more Malinois than the other Malinois that uh, that handler had. Um, so she was, she, she's a rock star. She was a rock star, could do nose work just as good as any of the Malinois that that, uh, that, that handler had. So, But she was this little smooshy-faced, uh, goblin-looking uh, um, Boston Terrier. If you have two or more dogs in the home, do you have to do these sessions separately to prevent competition and conflict? Yes, you do. Um, Thank you for bringing that up, too. Um, That is a slide that I want to add to this. Uh, If you have two dogs, put uh, put one away completely. Work with dog number one and then put dog number one away completely and bring dog number two back out. If they are hunting at the same time for the same resource, you can build resource guarding issues. You, At a minimum, you'll get a spat out of them when one finds it and the other one feels like they deserve it. And also, if you're doing nose work at home, keep it out of the kitchen. Um, if your dog's not already counter surfing and you start hiding food in the kitchen, <laughs> they're not going to shut it down just because there's no cardboard boxes there. Um, if there's a pot roast on the island or on the counter, they're going to go hunt for that just like they will will the chicken or the hot dogs or whatever else you're using. So um, use the kitchen as a staging area if you have to, but I would stay away from nose work in the kitchen uh, for a long time. I, I do. I will incorporate kitchen searches because you'll have to do that on the competition side, but we'll do that after the intro to odor class after we've started independently hunting just for the target odor. Um, if your dog is already counter surfing, I'd still avoid the kitchen because it, it's annoying. It'll get even worse if you uh, encourage that behavior even more. Could this activity help during stressful situations like 4th of July fireworks? Uh, actually, I would avoid it like the plague uh, during Fourth of July fireworks and stuff like that. 
um, again, I, I think the fear and anxiety that comes with the, the fireworks is going to supersede the food anyway. So um, trying to do, trying to get them to search for food while they're terrified because uh, World War III is going on, I, I think the best best course of action there is to just go find a dark, cold uh, place in the in, in your house to sit or move to where there's no people. Um, Fourth of July fireworks, gunfire. Um, anytime your dog is is over that threshold, I, I don't think I don't think any kind of training really helps uh, when when your dog's redlined, if you will. Okay. Um, Allison has a dog that can find food all over her garden. Any ideas about making scent work more challenging, or should she just keep it the same? Um, to make it more, so, so dog is finding food all over the place already doing this. Uh, I'm assuming the finding food all over the garden is, is a positive thing. And that's something that she wants. Um, if that is the case, then what you'll do is, is take the cardboard boxes, shrink them down, get something smaller. I've used, um, plastic lids from like coffee cans or, you know, I've had a couple of kids since I started, so we would have the baby formula um, plastic lid, and we would hide the food on those discs and hide them underneath things, make it so they have to work to find it and then to get it out. Um, add some elevation. You know, if you have a smaller dog, you're out in the backyard, put a lawn chair out, put the food on, on just set the food on the actual chair itself and have the dog figure out how to get up to where it's at. Um build things. Uh, I I did this at a workshop where um, we had bone through all of the exercises and we had about an hour left at the end and everybody still had another hours left uh, in them. And we took cardboard boxes and we just, I built a city out of these cardboard boxes, all these um, piles, three, four, five high. And I put a hide in there and had the dogs weaving their way through. And I, I called it dogzilla and where they would go in and knock boxes down and, and just have fun making a mess. And then they get their, their find at the end. Um, if you can, if you can look at it and know your dog can access it, try it, but let your imagination um, run to make things a little more difficult. And if you ever put something out, a box of hot dogs, you put it in the environment and it's too hard and the dog gives up on it. Don't think for half a second, you've broken your dog and made them resent hot dogs or resent searching. Just slide it out a little bit. Give them an opportunity to re-engage that search from a different direction with a different mindset and get in there and, and find success on their own. There is no breaking a dog when they're hunting for hot dogs. And that's not a challenge. Don't try it. But there, I, if there, it's a hot dog out there, most dogs are going to hunt until – until they can't hunt anymore or they find it. Okay, two more quick questions and then we'll have to hold the rest until later. Are the boxes placed up or down? Um, up. You want, the, you want the open part of the box up so they, uh, the dogs can get into them and self-reward. Um, if you have to step down and open the box or flip the box over for them, then the game's not really doing what you want it to do. You want them to find the success and get their, their, the motivation to do this all by themselves. So leave the box on the floor wide open. And how often and how long should you play these games in the beginning? In the beginning, you know, 10 to 15 minute bursts tops. Um, usually the average knows what class you get. Um, three to four runs through the day. Sometimes there's two hides, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's one, but dogs are actually searching for about 45 seconds to, to maybe two minutes, depending on the complexity of the search. And, um, and then that's it. And it doesn't take long. I have through, I think seven or eight minutes worth of search time through a one hour class. The dogs are usually pretty tuckered out as long as the searches were, were complex enough to, to challenge them. All right, I'm going to throw one more question in. Um, a recommendation for nose work rewards besides food treats because she is afraid that her dog will get overweight. Um, uh, you have to figure out. It, it's 
tennis ball tug to leash. You have to figure out what your dog is going to enjoy that's not food. If you have dietary concerns, um, all the stuff I was talking about with chicken and hot dogs, and things, that goes out the window. The health of the dog is more important than than finding something that, uh, that they want to eat that's going to potentially make them sick or worse. Um, I have had dogs that have had dietary con- dietary concerns, or they had one type of food that they can eat, and that dog worked for that food. He loved the search. He loved the he, he loved the interaction with the handler just as much as he loved the food. I use food because it's easy to put down. I use food because uh, I know all dogs love food. Um, you can play tug. I don't use tug anymore because I'm an old man who's been used as a tug toy for dogs for 23 years, and my back and shoulders can't put up with it any longer. So figure out what your dog likes, whether it's boy squeaks. Tugs, you know, I, 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 anything, whatever. It doesn't. There's, there's no set, uh, set list of things that you can and can't use. It, it really is up to your dog. Um, if they're out there hunting for a tennis ball, we'll, we'll go through this. You put the tennis ball in the box. Dog finds a tennis ball. Have a second one and throw the tennis ball on or near the box. This is where some handler interaction is going to be required. If it's tug, they find the tug toy. You're going to have to put a hole in the bottom of the box and have the dog tugging with the box on the, the tug toy. I don't necessarily recommend that because the dog is in the box and that might freak them out a little bit, but have an alternative uh, tug so you can get in there, slap it out there and then play tug with your dog. Um, and if that, if that, so what they want to search for, then by all means, use it. Do you have more to present, JC? Or um, I, I just have the do. conclusion. Okay. Uh, I think uh, going, I, I only have a keep. Keep going, and we'll we'll go back to the questions after when you're finished. Okay. Now the next slide. I, I'm going to change the order of these. <laughs> so the, the next slide was the conclusion. So. We have, we've talked about um, the scent and the act of smelling and how it can be beneficial to, to our dogs. Um, there was a study, and I really do need to find it because I spent, I spent about an hour reading it and processing it, and it was about six years ago. So somebody had done a study. It was posted on Facebook, so it's got to be true, right? Um, but the, they were equating dog sniffing and the chemicals released while they're sniffing, they were equating that to compulsive joggers or somebody who does something, some kind of an addiction or addictive activity. The chemicals that were released into these dog brains while they were sniffing created a situation where the dogs were becoming addicted to it because they felt so good while they were doing it. It, Sniffing was promoting happy feelings in dogs and and making them, I think the term was more optimistic and just allowing them to do it and releasing those brain chemicals and doing this activity improved their life from the inside. It wasn't about buying them a new soft bed. It was letting them sniff all of this other stuff. And it was making the dogs happier. It was making the handlers happier. And do know that if you are stressed, if you are anxious, or if you are angry, and you're trying to do anything with your dogs, they know that you are stressed, angry, and unhappy because of the chemicals that your body is uh, is, is putting out there, the pheromones, the all the other scientific words that changes our odors as well. And they know how to react to that as well because they are a better study of us than we are of them. Um, so you know, today we've seen a few ways that can allow dogs to, uh, to do this. And hopefully if you do start doing it, because your dog needs, needs some enrichment, hopefully it does start to help them. I mean, it's back to the beginning. I was talking about how those were, started as it is today is it started in an animal shelter in Los Angeles. It was started to provide some environmental environmental enrichment to the dogs that were stuck in the kennels, the inmates, if you will. The trainers would take the dogs into another room, throw some boxes full of food. And then what had happened was the dogs started to become a little bit more adoptable and the dogs started to get adopted. And it went from that to working with a group of 
of students who had dogs that couldn't do anything else because of reactivity or stress to um, now a nationwide phenomenon of, of uh, competitions and, and trials and uh, of so many different venues of people doing those work. But the root of all of that fun started with a couple of dogs at an animal shelter just just getting some yard time and some some environmental arrangement that made their lives that much better oops back 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 so here's our contact information um as i was pouring through the powerpoint presentation a different thought hit me i was like oh i need to talk about this i need to talk about that and like, i don't think anybody has the the amount of time necessary to hit all of the, the reasons why nose work is such a cool thing but if you want to reach out to canon co-pilots or um have questions about finding an instructor here's where you get it from um canon co-pilots is my website um, you can do a contact me form or just uh, directly email trainer at ccps at gmail or trainer ccps at gmail.com. Uh, the history of nose work from my vantage point, uh, you can find all of that at the NACSW.net website. They also have um, instructor, uh, an instructor directory too. If you live in, say, the middle of Alabama and you can't find an instructor, um, you can find one in Alabama somewhere on that on their website as well. Also, there's trial information. I'm not uh, going on the whole trial concept. I, I enjoy that part of it too. And for, for dogs that can handle it and humans that can handle it, it's an awesome, fun thing to do. Uh, you can get information right there as well. Do you want a few more questions? Um, I do, I would love to. Um, okay. Is there a best time to do nose work games, like before meals? Um, I don't believe, uh, I tell my students, bring their dogs to for the morning class, give them half of their breakfast. I don't want a hungry dog coming out. Um, I don't, I don't believe that, uh, a hungry dog is going to get the lesson better than say a dog that's had half or all of its breakfast. I actually think the hungry dog probably a little bit more stressed and more concerned with the fact that they left the house without eating. So, you know, if you're getting ready to go start, give them half of half of what you would normally give them. Give them 15 minutes, take them out, give them their break, and then start uh, start doing your classes or doing your, your training. Um, yeah, hungry, hungry, I don't think is a requirement. Okay. Um, Peggy has a dog that has severe trauma. He is shut down. Uh, doesn't bark. She heard that nose work would soothe him, but he ignores most things and is not food motivated. He's getting a little better, but is nose work recommended for a dog like this? I would give it a try. Um, where I, I would have to see there's a lot going on, a lot going on yeah. with that, you know, what part of the trauma what is the dog willing to do? Is the dog willing to accept another trainer coming to the house or going to to um, the the training venue? Um, and actually, you said Peggy, right? Yeah. Um, how if Peggy, make sure you get my information and reach out to me afterwards. There's, there's more to it than a simple yes or no. Um, looking at it. Uh, I'm looking at your, your post right now. Um, if you give me a call later or whenever you're available, I can get into more of that. I just want to know a little bit more about what caused the trauma. Um, yeah, sometimes if it's, a, it's genetic, if the dog was born this way and there was no real trauma that happened, you're dealing with something else. And that's where I would absolutely say you talk to behaviorists, talk to somebody who specializes in the behavior side of them. But if it was trauma from a bad situation, yeah, start with nose work. Start with small little boxes. Do not traumatize the dog and just let them eat out of it. Um, and then when you want to move somewhere else, just take those exact same boxes and let them be the context you in a new environment. And you just slowly move into these other environments until the dog 
can move in, go, oh, crap, what is this? And then recover and then move on with their life. He's not food motivated, though. Is there something else that she could use that uh, uh, she's talking about shut down? So I don't know. But if a dog isn't food motivated, does it mean you haven't found the right food? I believe that it's more you haven't found the right food. I've heard I've heard people say my dog is not food motivated. And I'm like, well, your dog didn't starve to death, so they are food motivated. They will eat. You just have to find the right thing. Now, if, they, if we're talking about the same dog, there's extreme trauma causing a shutdown. We know that a dog who's under stress and pressure to a certain level will stop eating. That might be what you're seeing. Um, increase the level of, of the... Uh, motivator. You, know, you might have to go above and beyond um, what you would normally do for a dog who isn't uh, traumatized and who is food motivated. Um, you know, try it, different things, a little bit, uh, little different bits and pieces of different types of food until there's one that the dog does do. That is awesome. Um, again, I'm a lab person, so I've never, I've never actually dealt personally with a dog who's not food motivated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess not. Um, okay, what about using nose work on walks? Um, this is someone who is throwing treats on the ground to distract her reactive dog. This It's a kind of a different situation because she's saying once yes. he reacts, it's too late. Well, that's kind of, that's not a nose work question as much as, yeah, you're already too close. Well, you know, well it's a scent work because I actually do exactly that with some of the active dog. Um, you know, I will work with um, slightly reactive, you know, mildly reactive dogs. If they're people reactive, you no, know, I will send them to somebody else who knows what they're doing. But um, what uh, what I would do with these dogs that are just barking, just more alarm barking and not meeting over that threshold. Is, is I, um, I tell my tell the tell the students to bring a handful of of cheap dog food that you don't care about wasting. And as soon as you start to see those signs, the the stiffening, the head coming up, the ear twitches, whatever body language that that your dog displays when when they're about to react, I just drop dog food oh, on yeah. their head. I told them my head and throw it and I start at their head and I work their way to the butt. So at some point in time they come up and they start scanning going, where are you at? And then they start to turn and look for the food that they're expecting to hit them in the butt. And what then started to happen was the dogs were, instead of scanning for the big, bad, mean creature that they had to drive away, they're scanning for the thing that started their nose work trip. And as they would start to turn and come back to me, I'm just throwing more dog food down in front of them. You know, we might go through a, a half a bag of dog food as we are getting the dogs to burn on their own and start to move away from the potential threat on their own uh, instead of getting in. Because what I have also found is I'm just as clumsy as everybody else trying to get in and move the dog around and walking in front of them. I, I, my timing was never good enough to do it. So I just used nose work. That, that idea of turning and sniffing it lowers their head. Um, puts them in a more of a submissive position moving away so the other dog doesn't react. No, well, it, it worked just as well, if not better for me, to move the dog back. What about after the dog is already reacting? I think that's what she's saying at that point. Okay. Will it? I think after the dog has already reacted and it's an almost true emotional reaction, I don't care what what kind of food you throw at it? It's reacting. There, there's. I don't think there's nose work that's going to, uh, um, that's going to change that pure emotional reaction. Um, I, I do have a theory on their dogs that are reacting for real because of the emotion. They hit that red line and then they explode. And then there are dogs that react just to drive other dogs away, and they're barking. But it's not truly an emotional reaction. It's more of a habit or more of some a, a defensive uh, maneuver. Those dogs will generally take food right away. It's the ones that are really reacting out of a fear response or, or um, you know, some kind of some kind of a red line emotional reaction. Those dogs don't care if you throw a half a, a half a pack of hamburger at them. Yeah. They're not going to be 
concern with that. So once you, yeah, once you, once you figure out which one your dog is doing, whether it's just being a jerk or they're truly reacting, you know, the ones that are jerks, the, those I think you can actually work with and move away. And I've seen that in, um, we will be doing a search in a park and we're working in parks and you can't control the other entities in there. You'll have a dog walk by. Reactive dog will turn around and bark, bark, bark. But the more seasoned ones that understand what's going on and may have gotten over some of that, that true emotional reaction, they will actually turn around and continue to search, make a find, and take your food. Uh, but uh, the ones that are truly emotionally reacting, once they bark, 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 you yeah, put them back in the car where the training is done. Um, and, and a similar question, how exactly does nose work help reactive dogs? Is it because it stimulates them and enriches them so they are less concerned when out on a walk? Or are you supposed to utilize nose work at the time of the trigger, which what we just talked about, uh, when they see another dog? Good question. And oh. yes, I, I, think it, it, I, I think it actually... You know, I, I, again, unscientific statement here. Don't come after me with science uh, on this, but I think it's rewiring some dogs' brains. I think it, it because it's it's getting those chemicals to flow and it's building trust in environments, it's building trust in the humans. It's starting to change the dog outlook on the environment that that is so terrifying, or the creature in the environment that is so terrifying. I, I just really think it alters the way the dogs are thinking, and. You know, life isn't so bleak anymore. It's not so, and I'm not saying life with humans is horrible, but what I'm saying is life with humans is hectic and busy and doesn't really fit the uh, dog's needs in their lives. So it, it's changing that a little bit. And it gives the human a 15-minute window through the day to give the dog what they need to help make that dog feel better. You think about a good, productive day at work. We spend eight hours, we get so much done. You walk home, you sure you're tired. Yes. Yeah. You feel good about yourself, and it makes going to work the next day just a little bit better, if not a little bit better each day versus uh, can't take this not another day type of a mindset because the days just slog on and there's nothing new. And I think that's what's happening with them is their, their, their outlook on their own life and their own experience is changing. It's for the better. Um, Josh wants to know if you have any books or other resources to suggest so um, he can learn more about nose work. Um, I, there's not any real definitive books that I would recommend. I mean, there are some. I think uh, somebody had mentioned it. Uh, I think the bookshelf is right here. Um, Dr. Horowitz is up here somewhere, I think that's her name. Um, um, yeah, it actually, shoot me a message. I'll look through my, my bookshelf and pull out my favorite ones. Uh, uh, no, that's not it either. Yeah, I'll shoot, uh, yeah, inside of a dog. She has uh, at least two, if not three books. Um, I have the other one up here somewhere. My daughter may have actually stolen it from me, but, um, you know, start there. Um, I think Ray Coppinger has some, some books and not every single book from start to finish is gold, but in every single book you, you read, there is a nugget in there for you. So just start with some of those things. Um, you can watch YouTube videos if you're more interested in doing the mechanics of of no work and to see what to expect in trials. There's lots of good BOs out there. There are some that are um, not so good, but it's up to you to figure out which one is uh, which one is which. Here's an interesting comment. Um, I think that nose work lets the dog be a dog instead of continuously adapting to a human world. Agreed. Agreed. I think uh, that was one of the slides that I, um, maybe one of the earlier slides, you just let them be themselves. Um, you, know, they, you, you, won't, you see how much your dog has to, um, has to adjust to us. Um, overall, I think in the existence, the coexistence between human and dog, the creature that has been forced to make the most changes to adapt to the other creature is the dog. Yeah. You know, it's, 
it's bad, but it's that's the way it has been for forever up until up until recently. I mean, I think the the the, the voodoo and witchcraft that is known as positive and clicker training has been around for about 30, 35 years. Um, all of this stuff is, is it's starting to change, but it's uh, it's a slow thing to change society and their, their views. I mean, you still go any there's places in this country where dogs live in in old uh, school buses out back because they're hunting dogs. Um, even in some of the working uh, the working world. Uh, a lot of it actually is you still have dogs in kennels because they're not really suitable for a a family up you know, up until i up until I started working for the uh, the government contractors like mm, I had one dog out of the twelve military dogs I had worked with that I would even consider bringing close to my house, so things are changing and things are evolving constantly, and you know what uh, what that comment was is. Yep, we let them be themselves and let them have a significant stake in something that we are doing with them. And you think about all of the other activities we do. You teach the dog to put their paws in the yellow, to go over the peaks, to go through the tunnels, where to go. And then you're on that course, you're telling them going to one, two, three. Everything is about human telling dog what to do, then dog doing it. Um, Obedience. Sit means this. And not what the dog thinks, but what we think. And everything about our existence up until nose work has been about human controlling the dog. Uh, I think the coolest part and, and the best teams that I've seen, because I've worked with teams all the way up to the summit level, is the teams that do the best are the ones that have a partnership that has equal, uh, they, they both have equal rights to the leadership. Um, the handlers that recognize when the dog needs help, it can step in and help. The handlers that recognize when the dog doesn't need help, those are the ones that excel because they stay out of it. And the ones that, that recognize when the dog wants to take control and they can allow that and you work together as a team, those are the best teams out there because they have this 50-50 relationship in this activity. And they will probably err on the side of giving the dogs about 70%. And only about 30% of it is stepping in to be the human. Um, yeah. Turns out humans aren't all knowing and uh, can probably benefit from just sitting around and listening to a, a, to a dog once in a while. There is one more question, it looks like. Um, after you use a box for a hide, can you then use the same box with no treats? As long as there's another box out there, uh, there's another reason why I use plastic too. I can wash those and um, wash those and store them, and, and it doesn't matter which one it was. It doesn't get complicated until later when I add odor. But yeah, you can use that that same box. There's going to be food residual there. Don't think by knocking all the crumbs out, it's going to take all the food out of there. But as long as there's a stronger target out there for them to find, they're going to find it. So yeah, you can reuse those same boxes. Uh, just to be be aware of the fact that the grease from hot dog soaks into the boxes. Boxes are very um, porous, and they will soak up all of the whatever odor you put in them. Um, Monica wants to know where in Virginia you're doing your nose work classes. Um, our nose work classes, the ones, only ones we have going on right now, are at uh, the Veterinary Health Center in Springfield. Um, if anybody who's on here, anybody watches the video is interested in getting classes started, um, let me know. We can figure out uh, um, figure out um, a way to get class started in your region. If you're not close to me or one of my trainers or somebody that I know, and try to help you set up your own uh, your own little program and, and set you. And someone that. else wants your phone number. Do you want that, or do you want them to just email you at JC? Uh, Let's see. They can they can have the phone number. Um, here, I'll pop it in there right now. Okay. And there it is. And if you contact me by phone, um, probably easiest to uh, to text me. 
um, or I'll get back to an email. It's easiest to text you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If I don't recognize the number, um, my car warranty is fine, so I don't bother answering the phone. (laughs) The phone won't have much anymore, so. Um, um, here's another question that just came in. Do you think it can be confusing to the dog if you're doing nose work where they choose what they're doing and obedience type training at the same time? This is a, a relatively new rescue. Um, it can be confusing. Uh, the context of one versus the other. Now, I don't even know if confusing is the right word. Um, when you're going into do obedience, say you're doing both at your dog's friend, and you walk in there, they see the blue floors, they get all excited, and then the obedience instructor comes in. You might see them uh, deflate a little bit because they really do want to do nose work, and it's not because one is more important to them than the other. It's just one is more exciting. They won't get confused. They're just going to do what they would rather be doing. I mean, remember, there's really not a whole lot we can do to dog to do what they want to do. And if they want to do the work, they're going to start. I've had the same question with ag- uh, from agility people. What if my dog starts to sniff at the start line versus get heat up and excited to go do agility? It's like dog enjoys doing nose work more than agility. So in this scenario, new rescue, you're trying to build a foundation and, uh, and finish your obedience work then start doing a nose work class. It looks to me like you know, uh, put your name in. Oh, there it is. Your, there's your phone number. Um, JC, thank you very much uh, to everyone here. Y'all gave each other a lot of great advice about rescue dogs and all sorts of things like that. Thank you for having me. Um, I said it. I did this presentation once years and years and years ago at one of the in-person um, free clinics oh, in Potomac yeah. at a community center. And I actually just took that presentation and just added to it. Because when I did it then versus now, it's like the whole world has changed. And it's not, not just the, the COVID and all of that, that stuff, but the, the whole nose work world and my mindset and my approach to it has changed since then. So, uh, to be honest with you, I was really making it up as I went on there because there was no book, there was no really good, solid uh, training program for um, getting into the nose work world and, and uh, how to introduce it to uh, um, the Pekingese that never worked a day in their life. Um, and it's, it's the coolest part of my 23-year working dog career is this part of it. So thank you all for coming and signing up and sitting through uh, sitting through some of my tirades and um, I'm babbling because I know I do incoherent babbling pretty well as well. Well, thank you very much. And uh, people loved it. <laughs>